I've decided to keep a journal. Hey, everybody, or should I say Ohio, which is what you say when it's the daytime. Welcome to Paul Casty for me, the podcast about film, culture, politics, and Paul Schrader, where we watch every film written and or directed by American filmmaker Paul Schrader and explore how they speak to their moment. And this one show is hosted by two guys. I'm one of the guys, Jake Serwindes. I'm one of the two lone wolves that lead this podcast. Yeah. Uh, Ian Des. Okay. He's dropped his family name. He's using yep. only his Christian name. Well, my Ken. Mm-hmm. What about, sometimes, you know, somebody's last name is Christian. Yeah, sure. That'll really trip you up. Somebody says, what's your Christian name? <laughs> mm. Getting getting into, what's Costello starting say? really okay. good. Yep. A, a word of introduction. The show has been and will always be a podcast about Clint Eastwood, but we turn our powerful critical minds now toward another subject. And it occurred to me that our new subject actually has a lot in common with uh, the protagonist of a recent major film release, a transplant from a humid land of strict tradition to a cruel, dry, and drug-addled new home, a figure who stands astride the worlds of art, criticism, spirituality, depravity, all at once, and brings them into something like harmony, a firebrand whose work holds within it the potential to inspire both liberation and dangerous reaction. Indeed, a very unusual young man named Paul. Ah, yes. Yeah, of course. I was thinking about this as well because we got Duncan Idaho in the film. We do have a Duncan Idaho in this film. Jason Momoa appears as an infant boy. <laughs> Probably wasn't. He was dead, right? <laughs> that would be cool. We've established on, yeah, he wasn't on alive this yet, show so that before yep. you're alive, you're dead. And that should bring great peace to all people. Yep. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, we're talking about Paul Schrader. We sure are. Um, I've been trying to think of a way that you, you might refer to the genitals as like a part, you know, your private part. So there's the famous uh-huh. Dune Your Mom joke, but then Dune Part 2 Your Mom? Hmm. I think Paul would like this. Uh, <laughs> starting back over. No, 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 no. Well, look, folks, yep. they say you have your whole life to write your Clint Eastwood podcast and two weeks to write your Paul Schrader podcast. So, can't expect it to be that good. Nope. No. Uh, how are you feeling about the new guy? I'm feeling really excited, man. I took advantage of the, the weeks we took off to do all the same stuff I do basically when we don't have weeks off, namely to watch movies and read about them and think about what we want to talk about. But I had a great time doing it, so no complaints. Yeah, I'd love to think about what I'm going to talk about. I am feeling, if you can believe it, a great deal of anxiety, which is unusual for me. Mm. This is a lot to, there's a lot to cover as we've, as we've talked about, as we, you know, when we revealed this new venture Paul Schrader uh, loves to talk and write so much, and there's so many <laughs> does. things that he's said, and I, I just, you know, I worry that, whatever, he'll talk about a movie in 15 places, and I'll read 14 of them, but the 15th is the one that had the really interesting thing in it, you know? Like, uh-huh. And also, you know, what he says about this movie in 1975, and what he says about this movie in... 2019 or whatever are both interesting but which one is important for discussing on this episode we also have to like how much do we give a shit about Sidney Pollock in all of this you know what I think that's interesting that you find that to be paralyzing because to me it's liberating to say this guy has said so much he disagrees with himself on many occasions and he started speaking and writing like that from birth a younger age than ourselves coming out of ucla not knowing a lot of stuff being mistaken about many things and being insightful about many things so i don't know i think i'm not concerned about unlocking i'm not concerned about getting the the final piece or something as long as we feel like we're engaging with a lot of the right stuff but not the right stuff the film that you were trying to get ahead of me Mm. saying something about the 1983 philip kaufman film the right stuff now this is a good time to maybe bring up a bit of listener mail. In the past, I've 
uh, you know, early early episodes of the the Clint podcast, I would bring up some. I'd say we had some listener mail, and then I would read like a letter from the BTK killer or whatever. Um, <laughs> yep, this is real. Would, yeah. This is from Pedro. Uh, Pedro, we thank you for sending in this bit of mail. I just want to read it uh, here, and uh, then we can discuss. Uh, Pedro says, "Stop your self loathing. You two have created a great podcast and should be proud of that." Looking forward to the Paul space. Pedro, thank you so much. No. Pedro, we really appreciate you saying that, but we will have to politely refuse to stop the self-loathing. Uh, sort of in the way that uh, a bird politely refuses to fly. You know? Uh, I mean, not to, not to fly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yep, I'm having some that. allergy issues. I don't know if you can hear that. I'm. You're taking us back to the the early days of the pod when it yeah. basically became an allergy pod. Well, it's just you know. Remember we had uh, we had a segment called Runny News. Usually, this is where I would mm -hmm. uh, recount something weird that the uh, nurse at the allergy office named Deb would say to me. Uh, I moved yep. and I don't go to that allergy office anymore. And I've recently. Uh, started. I'm um, um, establishing care at a new one. Got a lot of runny news for you, but I'll I'll update folks on that on a future episode because we got too much to talk about. But safe to say, we sure do. I, I feel and sound like shit, and I am so excited that this is the first episode of the Paul Schrader uh, series. Real quick, Ian, do we have a Patreon? We do have a Patreon. And if you believe it, it's not called the name of either of the shows that we have. Either of the, either of the show that hold we have. On, it's hold called on. Paid Costly well, For Me. Well, hold on. Okay. The show is still called Podcasty For Me, officially. Uh-huh. We're going to say Podcasty For Me. And I changed the name of the Twitter yep. account. And I need to do the Instagram, but I keep forgetting. Okay. But... The show is podcasty for me, I think, for, for SEO purposes. Speaking of SEO, uh, Warner Brothers really fucked up calling this movie The Yakuza because that is pretty yes, hard yeah. to Google. I don't know what they were thinking in 1974. <laughs> but anyway, we have, a, we have a Patreon. It's called Paid Costly for me, you were saying. I was saying. What kind of stuff that they got over there? We do all sorts of stuff because uh, over there we're, we're off the leash I like to say it sounds a lot like this. Do you still have bronchitis? Yep. It might be pneumonia now. Jesus Christ. We shouldn't so, do this show yeah. anymore. Yeah. Yep. It's pretty f lightly feverish maybe yesterday. Uh, so I think that's helping Christ. me as well. I'm channeling that. So over there we got Clint films from before we started reviewing Clint films somewhat arbitrarily. And now it's great. We've got Clint Ephemera, sort of the wider constellation, films by Sandra Locke, films by his other collaborators, people inspired by him, people who inspired him, etc. Exactly. It's a wonderful place with two episodes a month for $5 each month. And uh, several subscribers have uh, clicked the little like button attached to each episode mm -hmm. post. And so if you want to check that out, go to patreon.com slash podcasty for me. If you don't want to check it out, don't visit that website. The choice yep. is yours. There's a bunch of them out yeah. there. Yeah. Uh, I guess if people are coming to this as their beginning of their, their mm -hmm. podcasty for me experience, should we explain who we are or what we're doing? My name is... Sure. Let's do 30 second yeah. intros. My name is Jake Sirwin. I... Uh, am the co-host of a podcast and other than that i don't have a lot uh that that uh qualifies me to do this this is incorrect and i live in los angeles california which is a city on the west coast of the united states where much of the american film industry used to be based and uh -huh. with me yep. is a man that i know very intimately yep and his name is ian Ryan. And tell the people about you. That's me. Uh, you and I met at UCLA. We were both interested in film and literature and comedy. And, Describing himself in um, opposition to me. Interesting. <laughs> we left and we both played around with, with trying to figure out how we wanted to engage with film discussion, film enjoyment, mm -hmm. which, which type of film fans were our type of film fans. And... 
I think we found some Oscillating. wonderful people. Yeah, that's that's right. Uh, and now I live in Oaxaca and I teach and do sustainable farming. That's Oaxaca de Juarez down there in the nation of that's Mexico, right. the United States of Mexico. Mm-hmm. Different sort of United States. But in many ways, a similar one. Yep. Arguably adjacent. That's that's right. And behind me, since this is not a video podcast, I have all these Oaxacan katanas on the wall because of my great <laughs> admiration of... That would be so fucking cool. Wait, let's just brainstorm really quick. What would a Oaxacan katana entail? What do you think it distinguishes it? Is there a special... I mean, is there a metal... First of all, it's probably a machete. Okay. I would machete, say. Yeah. But All right. Uh, asked and answered. Well, today we're talking about the first film produced from any work by Paul Schrader, first major film. It's called The Yakuza, and it was uh, directed by Sidney Pollack. Uh, you might know him as the father of Sidney Sweeney. <laughs> yeah. It's just uh, something I was, I don't know. I'm tired of her. Shouldn't <laughs> have brought her up on my own podcast, but I'm hearing too much about this uh, young lady. Yeah. Self-inflicted, in my opinion. Speaking of self-inflicted, we'll get to that one of the, that uh, somebody in the cast sure of the will. film inflicted something upon himself. This is a movie that came out in 1975, unless you live in Japan, in which case it came out in 1974, Dying Days of 1974, mm-hmm. uh, based on a script by Paul Muad'Dib Schrader and <laughs> yeah. his brother Leonard. Lisan Gaib. Yes, Lisan Al Gaib Schrader. Schrader. Uh-huh. Now, mm-hmm. who is this Paul Schrader guy? You might be asking if you are one of the listeners. I'm uh, here to tell you. Great. Paul Schrader... And Ian, maybe we'll just sort of bounce around. We both kind of, we've boned up on the fellow somewhat. So mm-hmm. just jump in wherever. This is a guy from Grand Rapids, Michigan. Born in 1946, July 22nd, 1946. He is born to a uh, family of Dutch and German. Devout atheists. Oh, oh yeah. No, Dutch and German okay. background. And uh, born into the Calvinist Christian Reformed Church, the CRC. Yes. And uh, this is a very strict Calvinist church. And by very strict, he was forbidden from seeing movies as a child. He did not Mm -hmm. see his first movie until he was 17. Uh, He's pretty sure it was the absent-minded professor, and he didn't like it. It was so strict, in fact, that he once got in trouble when his mother caught him listening to Pat Boone records. Pat Boone, of course, famously... (laughs) The white guy who re-recorded like Little Richard in a safer, yes, yeah. whiter register. He, uh, his father had wanted to be a a minister, but could not. He had to uh, drop out of seminary because of the Great Depression, and so it became. Uh, he, he sort of uh, wanted to push his two sons, uh, Paul and Leonard, into the ministry themselves. So they were. You know, very, very strictly religiously educated boys, both of whom went to Calvin College, which is a yes, uh, a Christian Reformed private university in Grand Rapids, and uh, of course named for John Calvin, the Protestant reformer. Ian, he, can you fill us in real quick on this John Calvin fellow? What are the what are the big bullet points of a John Calvin? Sure. Well, you're John Calvin, I think most famously when people get the... He pees on the, the Toyota notes. logo. It's my understanding. <laughs> He's, He's urinating. often been witnessed doing this disrespectful act. Yeah. No, this guy, at least the reputation is that he believed in predestination of a kind. So, there was an understanding that your like role in life, your, your quantity of sins, your behavior was, was predetermined which I think creates a very unusual relationship between the believer and and Christ the king because then of course so like certain certain Christians are are elected to yes enter heaven regardless of their good deeds essentially and so 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 your your actions well, on earth are not your your entrance to heaven is not sort of earned through your behavior on earth is that basically correct i think we could say that it's earned through your behavior but you have no control over whether that will be sinful behavior or not so it's not really worth worrying over in some ways because by the time you are born your your path in life your mishi if you will yes has been 
determined and like you said, whether you're going to heaven or not. Now, I don't know if that's the exact belief of the CRC, but... Well, so Schrader, uh, Schrader's letters to his brother, Paul's letters to his mm-hmm. brother, Leonard, were... Extremely Christian thing to be doing. Yeah. Be, be named Paul and be writing letters. <laughs> Extremely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's an, he's an epistolary man in, in so many yes, ways. He sure is. He, uh, yeah. he sends all these letters to Leonard. I, well, I guess we're jumping around, but... Uh, Leonard is three years older than Paul. He gets out of, he graduates from Calvin and he gets his draft notice and he Mm -hmm. leaves the country to not go to Vietnam, which is cool and dope to do, I think, to dodge the draft. He goes to Japan where he takes up, uh, teaching positions at two universities in Kyoto, one of which is Kyoto University Mm -hmm. and the other of which is... Doshisha University. He's teaching American literature there. It's too expensive to talk on the phone, so he and Paul exchange letters. Uh, Leonard keeps Beautiful. all of the letters from Paul, and Paul uh, mm-hmm. has lost Leonard's letters. He f- learns this after Leonard dies in 2006. Leonard's wife, uh, Chieko, has a box of all the letters, and via film comment, Paul Schrader publishes all of his own letters to his brother, which constitute a journal of sorts, honestly, in a in a Schraderian yeah. way. Uh, they're fascinating to read. You can you can read them right now. Uh, we'll we'll post a link to the the archive in in the show notes. But he's Paul refers in one of the letters to you know meeting somebody at a party who who asked him if he was one of the elect. One of the Calvinist elect, and he sort of it reminded me of that uh that clip from the the leaked Tom Cruise Scientology video where he says someone asked a young Scientologist asked him if he'd ever met an s p and he laughs <laughs>, <laughs> Have I ever met an s p okay. so at least it's in this is operating in paul schrader's mind and and i I read in one description of Christian reformed Calvinism specifically. The notion of doing good deeds and sort of following God's way and Christ's teachings is meant not as a way to ensure your heavenly afterlife, but as a gift of gratitude for God's creation of life. God's God's giving you life, and in return, you sort of uh, you you do good, you perform mm-hmm. uh, Christianly. Which is an an ethic that is extremely relevant for our discussion today. The sense of duty. I had not noticed or, that at all. Uh, <laughs> nah, come on. Hey. Yeah. Um. Hey. So, yeah, Calvinism is fucking this guy's brain up real good. But he comes out of of all this, and the films that he writes initially. The ones that the one that everybody knows, Taxi Driver, yeah. comes out shortly after this. But he's and, he writes it before. So here's the thing with right. with with Schrade, is he's uh, he's a philosophy major, theology minor at Calvin. He wants to start yeah. showing films on campus, and he's like throughout his life, he's he's the man is terminally uh, at odds with everyone. He's just like <laughs> uh, he's a very opinionated. Little man, we should say yes. compared to Clint Eastwood, this is a short king. This is a this is a five. This is a short a five king. nine yeah. maybe five eight probably. Mm-hmm. And he's uh so he's he's trying to show movies. He's writing for the the Calvin College Chimes newspaper until he gets kicked off of that. It's also where he meets Janine Oppenwall, who's going to be his first wife. And similarly, if you go on his website, you can read a lot of his early film reviews yeah. from, from this period. Uh, shortly after. Yep. He starts writing these reviews. When they kick him off of the chimes, he starts a, a sort of an independent uh, newspaper within Calvin called Spectacle. And then one summer, while he's at Calvin, he goes to Columbia to take some film classes Mm -hmm. and he's at a party or a bar or something and he's talking to somebody about i lost it at the movies which is a collection of pauline kale's film writing pauline kale of course lifelong enemy of clint eastwood 
I lost it at the movies had just come out, and he was talking to somebody about it who turned out to be somebody who knows Pauline Kael. Says, let's go see Pauline. And so he goes to Pauline Kael's house, her apartment where she's staying. They stay up all night talking, and he sleeps on the sofa. He's like 19 or 20, and she's like 46, something like that. Yeah, I'm imagining a sort of my night at mods, a lot of um, sublimated sexuality yeah. and discussion of Blaise Pascal. I'm imagining a Harold and Maud sort of uh, okay. overt sexuality Great. and um, repeated suicidal pranks. <laughs> yeah. Cat Stevens uh -huh. is there. She says to him, you don't really want to be a minister, you want to be a movie critic, and tells him point blank that she can get him into UCLA graduate school whenever he wants. <laughs> <laughs> he goes back to Calvin, they keep up a correspondence, and he says, you know, is the offer still stand? She says, yes, she gets him into UCLA film school, bingo, bingo, bongo, must be nice. He comes out to LA, he's also writing for the LA Free Press, sometimes referred to as The Freep, which was a, mm -hmm. uh, you know, an alternative weekly, um, for which he writes movie reviews, and uh, gets... Uh, and, uh, you know, he, he rebels against the authority even of the editorial board of the Alternative, Alternative Weekly. Weekly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. His letters are so fascinating. He'll talk about, I mean, it's, it's just, I don't know if you got this impression from reading them, but like, it was so hard to be a film guy. Like relative to now, I mean, just because he's, you know, there's, there's several letters. Over just, oh, just to be able to see and engage yeah. with and understand and get information about yes he's talking no, about right. going to see like five movies a day uh because yeah. they're showing it afi and they're showing it on campus at ucla and all these all these rep houses around town lacma and he says for like four or five letters straight i really want to see nosferatu i'm trying to see nosferatu yeah. uh, which now you can watch on youtube it's in the public domain you know yes yep Yep. I don't want to be a return guy at all, and I am resisting mm -hmm. that, but I do admire the level of legwork that these all of these film heads had to put in relative to what we do now. And it's obviously better to have uh, democratized access to course. all these films, yes. but I'm, I am impressed that anyone managed to yeah. find any of this stuff. I mean... The mere fact that they're he and his brother are are calling studios and and you know just trying to reach out directly to actors and directors to get information and not just being able to look up like a yeah. you know YouTube promo interview or something and this is not even deep information sometimes this is like who who are the other people involved in this film because there's no way of finding out any of that information at all when he also he's describing these movies that he sees to his brother. And he is trying to get, like, stills from the studio mm, so that his brother yep. can see what it looks like, like, what the things he's talking about right. look like. Um, he also, yeah. throughout this, he keeps, I mean, it's it's very annoying. I, if you can believe it, I relate to the annoying young Schrader. The, the dynamic reminded me of ours in, mm, uh, yep, especially in the in the almost complete absence of response from Leonard. In this case, because Paul <laughs> lost the letters, but in our case, because you just sure, don't, he has an excuse. don't text me as much. Also, I also lost my letters. Yeah, but he's like, he will not shut up about Leonard buying him a, a Japanese camera at a much cheaper cost than the imported ones are in the... And it just goes on and on. And because you can't see how Leonard is responding to this, we have no yes. sense of whether... Leonard's like, please stop asking me about this, or he's saying, please give me more information about the like, camera. I'm working you want. on it. Yeah, yeah, right. And he wants a camera to take pictures of the screen. Did you did you find yes, that part? Yeah, I did. Uh, I also think it's okay to say this because it seems like Paul Schrader is very aware, particularly in this period of his life, of his narcissism. But without seeing Leonard's letters. It's hard not to imagine that he's just writing kind of like normal stuff and Paul is writing these extremely right. indulgent explorations of his feelings, of his job. Uh, and I, it's, it's great reading, but yeah. I have no idea I have a, if this is mutual. Just a little example of some of the... Okay, he, please. He, he yeah. already has the poster's disease, 
We know the man is a prolific <laughs> Facebook <laughs> user. Uh, he already has the yeah. poster's disease, even here in like 1968. This is just a, a from one of the letters. I'm taking a course with Peter Bogdanovich, director of Targets and author of several film books, on Howard Hawks. It's pure insanity. Bogdanovich is a prime example of the far-out, fanatical American critics who have learned the worst of everything from the Europeans. First class period, he screened To Have and To Have Not, just not, that's not the name of the movie, and said that the relationship between Bogart and Walter Brennan was one of the most profound in the history of cinema. Out of a hundred students, there are about ten Bogdanovich fans. The rest of us were retching in the aisles. <laughs> he refuses to think Hawks might be fallible, and even my friend Jean Marie, who is completely indiscriminate as he, as only the French can be, mm. thinks this cat's flipped. Bogdanovich as much said that the co the purpose of the course is to get you to lower your canons of taste, that you'll be able to appreciate the work of most any B American director. It's very interesting, however, and I'll stick it out. Hawks is supposed to show up for some of the classes. <laughs> I mean, what's weird is also in classic posters disease style, he does seem to have internalized some of that, this idea of like yeah. learning from B movies, unless he already had this from a different source. But I don't know. This one of these people who's, uh, you know, who he reminds me of is, is Lenin. I don't know if you've ever read anything that Lenin writes, but this is how he also talks where he will make an insane pronouncement yeah. that also reveals that he is like inspired and right. and drawing stuff from people that he is decrying simultaneously well, this is such a terrifying sort of way of thinking to me to be young and so powerfully opinionated and so willing to make these very declarative aggressive yes statements that are easy to say you're being a fucking asshole or you're wrong or something this is why i've produced nothing of merit in my life until uh well abundance of caution yeah there you go <laughs> till, uh, <laughs> uh, could be as early as next week we'll see yeah it's, com it's gotta um, be coming soon but but he already has just the he he feels so strongly about he he's about his convictions about everything um but then he will also you know that i i pointed out a in a there was a letter where he spends you know, five or six paragraphs talking about some movies he saw, catching up uh, Leonard on which Dutch last named person from Michigan is getting married or going to mm -hmm. Vietnam. And then deep in the second page of the letter mentions that uh, he was about 200 yards away from the murder of the two Black Panthers at Campbell Hall uh, on, uh, at UCLA. Yes. Now, I'm not chuckling at this awful murder at this time of uh, this height of conflict between black militarism and, and attempting to, to create some type of community protection. It's just insane that this would happen, particularly to a guy who in some ways is so sensitive to like cultural moments and signifiers and is, is attempting to be attuned to these things. He also just is so clearly uh in his own shit more than he is out of it absolutely but here is a i think a very telling description of his personal politics not that everyone has to be or even should be or ever is set in their ways at 25 but no here we go nope. violence came to ucla and to me I was on the campus most of yesterday, running from and baiting the cops. It was the full show, about 250 riot squad cops, tear gas, head-busting, arrests. The crowd was about 4,000, but split into three factions by the police. Both the crowd and police used the charge and regroup method. There were 100-plus arrests, and I saw at least a dozen kids get beat up rather badly. I also saw one cop go down when hit with a sock filled with lead pellets. Nice. I can't blame the police. They did their job efficiently. It's just that the comb of Cambodia and the Kent State killings drove 114 campuses up against the wall yesterday. The UCLA thing didn't get reproduced on the national news because it was happening everywhere. It really is something to see the mammoth tax squad cops, all leather, iron, and muscle, huge, huge men. <laughs> and when they charge, my God, everything breaks loose. Nixon says the bums on campus are cowards. I'm afraid he's got it mixed up a little. When the cops issue a dispersal order and the megaphone is so loud your ears ring and then charge, it takes more guts than I've got to hold your ground. And more guts than the soldiers in Vietnam. At least in Vietnam you've got a gun and you've got no choice. UCLA is closed down and as a result Pauline will probably head home soon, canceling out my projected symposium. As you may know, things are awfully tight in the States. So, 
Look, this yeah. is the this is the highs and lows, baby. This Absolutely. is what I'm here for. Yeah. Got to respect his his love of the radical, his love of the uh personal warrior for basically any type of cause, sort of yeah. even elevated above the cause itself, but also it seems like he's just sensitive to the specific issues. But then he uh, sort of veers and into like his little symposium. cruising style uh fetishism <laughs> for the yes. the yep. big leather bound cops. Uh yeah. And then also like, um, you know, it sucks, man. This is really fucking up my symposium. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. Leonard, for his part, is uh, also often unable to teach because of student activism in Japan. Yeah, this is kind of the height of, of uh, student radicalism. So he ends up often hanging out in bars with... Yakuza guys. Mm-hmm. The Yakuza, which we'll get into the the sort of nitty gritty of that in a second, but they are uh uh as listeners probably know, that's the major organized crime uh faction or factions in Japan, and they are largely based further to the west. Um on the island of Kyushu, which uh contains uh-huh. Osaka. Kyoto is between Tokyo and Osaka, it's halfway. Um, and uh, so, you know, as you get further west, there's more Yakuza guys. And he's hanging out in these Yakuza bars talking to these guys. Um, and throughout these letters, you can see Paul's interest in Japanese cinema grow and grow. He's asking Leonard for information. He's asking for... Uh, books on the subject. He's asking him if he's seen this film or that film. He does tend to abbreviate um, the term Japanese yeah. and also the term Nipponese, yeah. which uh, he abbreviates into yeah. three and four letter uh, words that we will not repeat here on the podcast. But, you know, it seems like he was writing these longhand, I guess. So, um, and also... I we I mean we're this is a thing we've got plenty of of digging to do about not not because of woke but just because of understanding sort of like how much you can engage with a culture and a culture cinema from the outside and I think in the 1970s even more than now you are distinctly on the outside when you engage with it absolutely there's a he writes a a primer is it primer primer what what is this British stuff you bring into the podcast now. Hold on. The which part are you objecting to? Primer. It's primer, or it's not. Yeah. Okay. Well, primer's stupid because it's got one M. Yeah. Yep. It's dumb. This is how. Do you think this is how long vowels work in English? So wait, hold on. I'm supposed to be saying primer, or you're making fun of me for saying no, primer? No, 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 no. I'm making fun of you for having been suggested we should be saying primer. Okay. Well, like my grandma told me to say primer or something. So. I'm just okay. trying to well respect to her. Being res- I'm just trying to being respectful. All right, so <laughs> okay, me too. We're all being respectful. Schrader <laughs> writes a primer on the Yakuza film for film comment uh, around when this movie comes out, in which he makes some very uh, broad declarative statements about what is and is not the character of yes. the Yakuza film. He's he is extremely well informed about aspects of this discussion yes. I would say. He is seeing these movies there are th- apparently at the time three cinemas in Los Angeles that are entirely devoted to Japanese cinema. Okay. So there is the Toho Cinema owned by the Toho Studio uh, which is on La Brea which is now a church and at the time it was a movie theater that looked conspicuously like a church which was which is kind of hmm. Schrader mode exactly yep. huge to think about it is across the street from a tire shop and uh, near a Lassen's which is a grocery store Ooh. so Christian that it is closed on Sundays <laughs> but it's like one of those Christian organic or like the sort of the, the melding of natural foods in Christianity yeah Interesting. Which, which I associate also very strongly with like the 70s and early 80s when you could have both those things simultaneously. Exactly. But you hop on down to La Brea Boulevard, you can still have them, still available to you. Mm. So he goes there. He goes specifically the of the four 
Japanese majors, Toei is the one that uh, was most famous for their Yakuza films. They're sort of the what what Warner Brothers was to the gangster movie, Toei was to the Yakuza movie. That's certainly how Paul characterizes it. There is also, of course, the other studio, Nikatsu, that uh, focused on what's called borderless action, which is also considered a branch of the Yakuza film. But So you're telling me that maybe he thought that all the movies that were available to him were all the movies in the world? Is that what I you're saying? I am precisely saying that. And I think that's fine for our discussion because what he tries to write is one of these apologies for my non-Japanese, but Ninkyo Ega films, which is like a chivalry Yakuza film. Right. Very distinct associated with Toei that you're talking about. Right. And I mean, we're, this, this is right after the, or right in the same period as the Spaghetti Western is, is taking off. And there are also still traditional Westerns being made. I mean, Clint himself goes from, well, Paint Your Wagon isn't a traditional Western, but you know, he goes from, from the- Rawhide, if you count that as cinema. Yeah. He, he makes a fistful of dollars and then goes back and shoots some more rawhide, if I'm, if yep. I remember correctly. So, and, these things and can Paul exist basically once. says that they're in the midst of their evolution where they're trying to figure out, are they going to uh, stay in traditional? Are they going to jump to spaghetti Western? You know, he's, he's distinctly aware of this, this Has analogy. he not seen Tokyo Drifter? I don't know. Like, Cause it, this, that, this is what I mean. Or, or branded to kill. It seems like he's not yeah. aware of this or he considers of them a different Sajun type of film. Suzuki. Yeah. Wait, Tokyo Drifter has Yakuza guys in it, right? Cause that's 1966. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. It's considered yeah, a Yakuza yeah, yeah. film, but that's, I mean, it's, I don't think it's considered a chivalry film unless I'm, uh, okay. Mistaken. But yeah, he, he makes his really declarative, really declarative uh, statement. So yeah. he's also going to the Linda Lee Theater, which is downtown. Mm -hmm. It became the downtown independent oh. uh, for any, any of our LA heads, um, although that closed during COVID and has not reopened. Uh. Before that, it was the Teatro Azteca and only showed Spanish language films. So this is a downtown theater that was owned by Toei. And I've spent a lot of time in the past couple of days on cinematreasures.org. I love this mm. website so much. Here is, uh, so on cinematreasures.org, you get a lot of old guys who remember these theaters and just post little reminiscences about it. And it's mm. so lovely. Los Angeles is history. I mean, there's a lot of Los Angeles history, but one aspect of it is former movie theaters that people remember fondly. Oh, and, yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is from a comment by user Vienna on cinematreasures.org. Starting around 1974, I used to go see movies at the Linda Lee on an almost weekly basis, interspersed by viewings at the Toho La Brea and the Kokusai. Uh, podcaster's note here, the Kokusai was uh, in Crenshaw. I loved that old Linda Lee theater and was both saddened and angered by the theater's fate. If you called the theater, a recording would give you the list of films. There were three films per bill and their starting times. The recording would start off in English, and whoever did the recordings tended to sound a bit like the villain in an old World War II movie. The opening phrase, This is the Linda Lee Theater, the home of Toei Films exclusively. Imagine this being said in a voice reminiscent of Sesue Hayakawa. After the English version, the whole spiel would be given again in Japanese. The inside of the theater was basically one big box with the screen taking up pretty much all of the west wall. There were two, if I recall correctly, exit doors below the screen in either corner. The theater did have a balcony, and the balcony had a feature you don't see anymore. A crying room. This was a walled-off <laughs> section of south side of the balcony with a large floor-to-ceiling pane of heavy glass. At the rear of the section were heavy drapes to muffle any sound from the area. In earlier days, patrons with small crying or fidgeting children who still wanted to see the film would be exiled to the crying room so as not to disturb the other patrons. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, there were f quite a few aspects of the theater that held over from the earlier periods. The men's restroom had scratching plates mounted on the wall next to the urinals so the men could strike their matches and light up a smoke while answering nature's call. When I first came to L.A. in 1970, I was fascinated by all the old theaters still existing in downtown L.A., particularly those east of Broadway. Those fine old theaters, some a bit worse for wear, some on their last legs, were like magnets to me and I spent a goodly amount of time visiting them and exploring the insides. One, whose name I have forgotten, I found out later, had been the very first opera house in L.A. At the time I saw it, it was an X-rated movie house, but a great deal of the old interior was still intact. Sadly, it was torn down like a lot of the old Main Street theaters, often for nothing better than to become one more parking lot. I am thankful I got to see them before they faded away, 
and I am very thankful for the help of the sometimes befuddled theater managers or projectionists who put up with me asking questions rather than seeing the films or whatever was on the bill. So it gets in a just a clarification at the end there that he did not see the porno. Uh-huh. He just went in to look yeah. at the interior of the theater. I'm doing but, an enormous uh, occidental bow to this man for his <laughs> service. Uh, one more briefly. Uh, this is from Jim Mitchell, who has posted an image here, either of himself or of M. Emmett Walsh. Pretty hard to tell. <laughs> All right. Uh, this is from 2014. My girlfriend, now wife, nice work, Jim, and I used to drive 60 miles to Los Angeles to see Kurosawa movies at the Toho La Brea. This would have been the mid-60s. I especially remember Yojimbo and High and Low, both starring the great Toshiro Mifune. An added date night benefit, the Cherry Blossom restaurant occupied the top floor of the theater so we could have a Japanese dinner before seeing the movie. I think it was the Cherry Blossom that ran a small newspaper ad saying, Sukiyaki tempura served by girls in kimonos and other delicious Japanese dishes. <laughs> I am doing a second bow to yep. Jim Mitchell. Yeah, look. One other aspect, of course, we're going to address here is the Western fascination with Japan, ranging from post-war era to now. But yeah. I, can I say that sometimes it's fun to eat uh, the food from a place that a foreign movie is from before you watch oh, that type of absolutely. movie? absolutely. Especially if you uh, pay people from that country who have yeah. emigrated to where you yep. live to yep. prepare the food. And you hopefully don't do any of that stuff from licorice pizza. Right. Uh-huh. Yeah. I it Just, you know, these guys talking about how they remember the copy of a newspaper ad. Also, even as a fan of maps, got to give it up to this generation of people who are observing which wall was the southern wall in a building that you are inside yeah, of. Yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of very helpful autism on this website. No yeah. other way to put it. Paul Schrader says that when he and Leonard decide to to start working on this script together, he goes to the Toei Theater, the Linda Lee downtown, five days a week or something like that, because they change the bill three times a week. Yeah. Uh, so he would basically see nine movies there a week. And I believe he said that he saw 50 of these Yakuza pictures to the point that he was fully in the mind of one of these Toei screenwriters. Yeah, he said he basically got the generic moves down pat. He is He's fully absorbed the genre. And we didn't uh, address it fully, even if it's sometimes mistaken. The primer is a wonderful insight into, at the very least, Paul's understanding of this genre of film. And he goes into great detail and uh, it does his best with the contemporaneous translations of these films and actors' names. And uh, I don't know. I think it's worth checking out. Basically, if you're going to watch this movie, I, I recommend it because I think it's, it, is. it changes fully your, your understanding of it. Before we get to the movie, we have to talk about this major... Uh, do you want to do the two questions before we get to the movie? Oh, my God. We haven't <laughs> done the two questions. <laughs> yeah. Fucking hell. I've been waiting. So now that we've finished introducing the podcast, we have <laughs> yeah. to do the two questions, which is our signature segment where we talk about, uh, we ask two questions. And I have one, and I'm going to go first. Have you ever pursued a creative project with any of your brothers? Ooh, great question. Um, certainly not since I was a child. We used to do little stories and games and stuff together. So if you mean a creative project that was intended for like a public audience, well, you know what? I'm going to give a different example. Okay. I went on stage, I believe at Pine Crest, which is a uh, like a little lake camp up there in Northern California. And I was on stage with my brother, Adam. Uh, he is my brother who lived in Japan for a year uh, on foreign exchange from UCLA. Wow. Yes. He's my Leonard Trader brother. Uh, he's not. He is, I think, a much healthier understanding of uh, racial politics and... Um, cultural anthropology but we did a little performance i want to say i was four or five and he was eight or nine well wow. and uh first things first got on stage introduced myself as adam and him as ian so my performance style has not changed <laughs> <laughs> wait was that not the bit <laughs> nope nope just oh, forgot my own good. name forgot my own I name on that. stage love uh, that and then i believe uh if i remember our acts correctly 
I fired an arrow and he caught it or the other way around from a homemade bow and arrow that we had constructed. Holy shit. <laughs> yeah. So. You're doing the bullet catch at four years old? <laughs> yes. No, I'm, yeah, I'm pretty sure he was doing the bullet catch at nine years old. But I suppose. Uh, it was my greatest success and that's it's fine. wonderful. Don't regret it. Thank you. Uh, my sister and I, of course, made lots of little movies, mm. uh, most of which involved me getting hurt. But don't worry, I was the one writing them, so... Okay, great. Uh, Yeah, and they're all gone forever. Probably not. Uh, I don't know. She's probably... she She's a kind of a, a digitizer, so I'm sure they're... Would love to see this. Yeah, I'm getting hit in the face a lot, stuff like that. Yeah. We used to do a... So my, my high school had like a, a Friday morning video announcement thing on the okay. on the TVs. And we were both on the newspaper staff, and we would make a little commercial for the newspaper when it came out. I think it was every other week or something. So mm. we'd make a little commercial, like, remind you to go get your Oracle newspaper. Great. And uh, the punchline, it was, it was all just like a setup to find some way for me to get struck across the face with a rolled up Oracle. Wow. So you sort of built this this runner this uh, tension that the audience could depend on this is excellent yeah lighting was really bad but there was one <laughs> sure. where we actually did you had uh, next to no light boxes available to you none but there was one where we did the uh the pulp fiction royale with cheese bit but it was the oracle with cheese or something i don't know it sucked but then i got hit in the face with a <laughs> all right so you redeemed it yeah uh so that yeah there's that's my two question what do you what do you have uh, my two questions is one that I can't answer, but I was just hoping to, uh, just prompt a little story from you. What's your favorite, uh, okay. isekaya that you've ever been to? You've been to Japan. Your man has been to Japan. I have Japan. been to Japan a very normal number of times and I behaved normally <laughs> then yeah. about it and now. Yep. Uh, here's what I'll say. Japan is a country that is at once familiar and, uh, very distinct from my experience. <laughs> Like it's okay. it's a yeah, nice I mean, blend you've of been wrong, I'm sure. it's a nice blend of I know how to behave here and also this is this is uh, very unusual to me yeah. and it has plenty of social and political problems and they but they are often different from the ones that I have to think about. All this the is time. why you so will I, never be Paul Schrader. You need to talk about the specific character of the people and uh, the defining features of the moment. I will say that in my interactions with people who live in the parts of Tokyo that tourists go to everyone on the whole tends to be a lot nicer than they are uh in the united states and i for one welcome this i think mm. it's nice when people are nice and it has something to do with uh ancient belief in the power of the animals or whatever <laughs> fucking rocks rocks have spirits in them or whatever the goddamn thing is that paul schrader would say um yeah my favorite is Akaya that I have ever been to. Let me think. I mean, my favorite restaurant experiences in Japan have generally been of a more specific restaurant style, like a mm. Okonomiyaki place, which is like the the uh, sort of cabbage pancake that uh, with yep. bonito in it, and you put a bunch of cupy uh, mayo and and Japanese barbecue sauce on it. I will say, you know what? The first time I went to Japan, I was with a college friend, and we were sitting at a booth eating whatever, and there was a group of women next to us with like a couple of, it was maybe like four women and two men or something, and okay. probably like, an, it seemed like an after work meal because they were all dressed like they were, they'd come from an office, and one of them pulled out a box of sweets. And right. I guess because of the way, like the closeness of our table or something, or maybe they thought it would be funny. I don't know. It seemed important to them that they offer us the sweets. Mm. And this was like our second day in Japan. I had never been outside of the country. I'd never been on a trip without my parents before. Oh, um, I don't think I knew this. And I was I knew you when you took this trip. Yeah. Yeah. Big moment. Um, Big, big move. And uh, they... Offered it to us. I believe it was some kind of red bean paste ah. that they basically put on a little like scoop and just fed into our mouths. Oh, and okay. I was like, "What is right. it?" They didn't speak a lot of English, and they said Japanese sweets. 
Mm. And I'm like, I, I mean, I, you're not telling me anything I didn't already know. <laughs> yeah. And I, and because of the sort of social pressure of the situation, and also being in a foreign country where I, you know, you, I just wanted to err on the side of respect. Okay, like yeah, yeah whatever. You, you're kind of you're in the lead here. Like I don't want to, yeah. I don't want to be a dick. I don't want to offend anybody. So I will. If you're offering me something, I'll take it. So I let uh, a strange woman put some food directly into my mouth, and then my friend and I are sitting at the table. They get up and leave because that was their dessert. And my friend and I are sitting at the table, and we're like, "Well, how long until we know it didn't have <laughs> like anything in it?" Obviously, these office ladies that aren't would not dr- have been my drugging concern. me. Yeah, but I'm like nope. 21, 22 when I. I think if they did anything to you, it was to lead you by the nose and maybe just force you into a uh, public sub position that has nothing to yeah. do with their culture at all. I can't say, yeah. but it's very yeah. funny hey, to let's... imagine. Let's trick these schmucks into thinking that they have to let us put food in their mouths. That'll be <laughs> funny. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Which I think is great. And then there was a time I was in like a 7-Eleven at night and these two really drunk guys came in. <laughs> Did the and... same exact thing? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. One of them, uh, it was the same trip. One of the, there were two really drunk guys. One of them was a Japanese guy who didn't speak English and one of them was a French Japanese guy who spoke very heavily French accented English. Got it. And they wanted to know we were in the nightclub part of Tokyo, the like kind of trashy nightclub part that mm. I uh, the name of which escapes me now, but he was saying asking us if we wanted to come with them. Uh come like party with them because uh, we uh, have a girl with us, a uh, girl with uh, very big tips. <laughs> okay. Uh, and we politely declined. Yeah. Uh, so that was my, that's my Isekai experience. Perfect. <laughs> exactly what I imagined you would tell me. Yep. So a couple things happened to me that scared me, even though nothing really happened. That's, yeah. that's what, uh, <laughs> that was my experience. Okay. That was the two questions. We're talking about the Yakuza. Now this is a film that Paul and Leonard write. Uh, Paul has written, he writes this sort of calling card script called Pipeliner that is about like a guy who goes back to Michigan. Um, don't know where he got that idea. <laughs> mm. And joking aside, I think. Paul is extremely transparent about many of his early films being uh, extraordinarily autobiographical. autobiographical. Yeah. yeah, there's a there's a BAFTA lecture that he gave a couple of years ago where he sort of outlines his screenwriting method, and it always begins with uh, what what's a problem that I have, and what's yeah. a good metaphor for exploring that problem. Um, oh, we didn't even talk about transcendental style. There's so much to talk about. I know. Well. I, I fear we have to spread transcendental style out of, over the entire oh, podcast. Of course. But but he he writes this as a master's thesis at UCLA. He writes he's about what twenty seven, twenty eight, something like that. He writes a book called Transcendental Style in Film, which is he he describes it often as a kind of a purge act or a a a, a calling, a mission, a thing he has to get off his chest, where he does a bunch of research into he writes kind of an almost like a like an ethnographic text about yes the way that filmmakers from across the world in this case two from very close together in europe <laughs> and one from japan ozu uh bresson and and dryer so uh, working in, in Denmark. roughly the same period dryer obviously a little bit earlier but a- arrived yeah. at a conjunction of stylistic elements with seemingly the same goal not to say that they're Goals and their elements always overlap, right. which I think he does a good job of Just clarifying. Way, ways of using cinema, using the style of cinema to try to try to bring in the mind of the viewer a, a, an awareness of God or the transcendent. Um, yeah. Interestingly, in, in one of the letters to Leonard, he mentions what I guess was an abandoned section that was going to be on Bud Bedecker, the American director of Westerns. Yes, uh, which I think makes sense given some of what he says in his primer his fascination with westerns and uh his primer uh, yeah yep but uh I, because he didn't direct this movie i don't see a tr- tremendous amount of transcendent style in it and i don't think we need to nope talk i don't think about so it either. too much further It'll come if up there's more... anything 
It will certainly come up more. I think some of what he talks about with Ozu, because he does weave in cultural practices and uh, like so-so historical events or concerns. So uh, he, I think, begins about eight paragraphs in a row saying, in Zen, such and such a thing happens or is important. And I imagine that was on his mind since it basically comes up in the film almost directly. It does. So he writes the pipeliner. There's a guy who uh, a literary agent named Michael Hamelberg who gets it through some some friends of Schrader's who likes it he wants to finance it it doesn't end up getting made but while it's falling through his marriage falls apart and the affair that caused the marriage to fall apart also falls apart uh-huh yep. um he f- falls into what he calls a state of manic depression and he I'll just read the Read directly from this interview he gives to Film Comment in 1976 when Taxi Driver is coming out. I got to wandering around at night. I couldn't sleep because I was so depressed. I'd stay in bed till 4 or 5 p.m. Then I'd say, well, I can get a drink now. I'd get up and get a drink and take the bottle with me and start wandering around the streets in my car at night. After the bars closed, I'd go to pornography. I'd do this all night till morning. And I did it for about three or four weeks. A very destructive syndrome until I was saved from it by an ulcer. I had not been eating, just drinking. When I got out of the hospital, I realized I had to change my life because I would die and everything. <laughs> I decided to leave LA. That was when the metaphor hit me for taxi driver, and I realized that was the metaphor I'd been looking for. The man who will take anybody any place for money, the man who moves through the city like a rat through the sewer, the man who is constantly surrounded by people yet has no friends. Uh, he writes the script in like two weeks, and then he's bumming around the country and he and Leonard work out the idea for Yakuza, takes it to Hamelberg, um, and he pays them to come to L.A. and write it. So Leonard and uh, Paul are living in an apartment in Venice. They write it in about a month and sell it for $300,000. Yes. Which at was least, like a big deal. Of course. At least retrospectively... He claims that he was sort of channeling this Toei style because we didn't talk about the fact that in the development of the Yakuza genre or maybe the chivalry subgenre, part of the production style becomes this uh, absolute machine, which he compares, of course, to the studio system where he says these films get produced in three weeks. Now, I read that and read it as they get shot in three weeks because even that to me sounded, you know, insane. But he means produced in three weeks uh they're given like yeah. two or a week or two to write uh, a week to shoot and then they get edited and they go out but yeah he says he, he in that primer uh names the first yakuza film with outdoor locations that he saw right. so i think that suggests how they how they get these things done so quickly but i do think it's interesting that taxi driver is written before this because yeah. uh Again, also sort of like an exp- expurgating act to write that. But this movie is, I'm going to argue, kind of an act of film criticism in itself, or like an act of film history, in that he is, he and Leonard, and Robert Town, who rewrites it, and, and from what I can tell, uh, mostly just softens the Mitchum character, like takes some of the Travis Bickle-style unpleasantness off of him. They write a movie where they they basically take the American noir style detective and put him in a Yakuza film context to sort of show how the two genres are related to one another, which to me feels almost like, I mean, it's, it's certainly the kind of story that would come from the mind of someone who thinks like a critic to me. Well, and I'm going to add as he points out in the primer, that uh, the connection seemingly is almost stronger between Westerns and the Yakuza film than than noir gangster films and the Yakuza film because of this interest in sort of uh, high virtues or right, moral right. decisions and, and really demonstrative acts, basically, uh, yeah. against uh, like greater forces. And it makes sense. I will say we often check out 
uh, other films by the people involved before we discuss these these uh, main features in our episodes. I thought you were going to say we often check out of the episode around an hour in, no. which is true. <laughs> okay, That's maybe true as well. Uh, audience, come back for a little bit, please. Now, yes. I don't know. Did you have a chance to watch Jeremiah Johnson? I did not have a chance to watch Jeremiah Johnson. I have seen the gif of him nodding. Okay. Of course. Um, I watched some of Out of the Past. Mm. Uh, I rewatched some of Out of the Past. And I reflected upon uh, some Japanese films that I've seen, but I didn't have a chance to watch uh, any of these Yakuza Ega Oh, films. Uh, all right. Well, I'm going to suggest to the listeners, Abishai Prison, fun. Uh, Good. Much, much more artful than I was led to okay. believe by our friend Shrade, because he describes them as such a product of the system. Yeah. And you know, that's yeah. the first commercial success uh, starring... Takakura Ken, are we saying Takakura Ken? Ken Takakura? Yeah, we well, uh, listeners, we are going to do our best to get everyone's uh, order of their names correct. However, due to obviously the realities of Western, especially contemporary to this film, uh, writing on the the like, I just found out the other day that it's it's Kitano Takeshi. I assumed Takeshi was the last name this whole time. Oh it's, no, yeah. yeah. Well, because his name, yeah, I don't know, but uh, okay. it's because his his stage name was Bito Takeshi, which I assumed meant that he had replaced his uh, first name with I Bito. Can see your Not, yeah. So anyway, we're gonna do our best, but Takakura Ken, like we're not gonna say Watanabe Ken because that's showing right. off. Nope. Yes. Uh, I, it's or like, just kind of a yeah. crapshoot, depending on how much American exposure they already have. Anyway, the point I wanted to make about Jeremiah Johnson is that yeah. This film is incredibly thematically similar, sort of despite Schrader's script, maybe, because it is about a mountain man who goes to live and sometimes be in conflict with the indigenous tribes uh, of the Rocky Mountains. And after violent encounters and the death of a woman and a child, that they sort of uh, come to a begrudging respect. And sort of like a, this sense that there's a mutual understanding, even if there will never be. It's sort of like a Zeno's paradox of of you can never t- totally arrive at being of this other culture, but maybe you can understand each other right. enough to to be in a a place of like companionship or something. The weeb of the plains <laughs> yes, or the mountains, basically. Yes, um, we've had a, a number of conversations off pod about whether or not we can say weeb, and I've decided that we can yep. um, because this movie so is about. What if a white guy was so honorable that he yes. basically became Japanese? Now, I mean, the question is, who is the truer weave in this film? Is it him or is it his friend who lives in Japan? Sort of like the more traditional yeah. guy who's just obsessed with Japan, but maybe yeah. never lives Japan. Right. The, you he's know sort of a... Yeah, he's he's the... the there's the academic way to... Uh-huh try to absorb another culture and then there is the uh taking a wife <laughs> way to absorb another culture yeah. um it's a little bit of production context initially the film is going to go ahead with lee marvin our friend from uh, other movies we've talked about um and <laughs> yeah, robert aldrich undoubtedly undoubtedly um yeah. Yeah, director Robert Aldrich. Aldrich, of course, director of The Dirty Dozen and Whatever Happened to Baby Jane and Kiss Me Deadly, uh, and a bunch of other really cool movies. Um, and I think this would have been a worse movie, and I like several of the movies you just mentioned. Interesting. I don't. I mean, I don't. I don't know. I, I think with Marvin, especially, it would have been a worst movie because he has a little i like lee marvin but i think he has less depth than he's stonier than, for sure oh yeah. yeah 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 and apparently literally i think he was like a big pothead i know he was drunk okay. all the time too but um, well that's also true of mitchum but yeah that's also true uh so uh marvin can't do it so then aldrich wants uh mitchum they had worked together um <laughs> on a previous film and he he met with <laughs> they met and Aldrich says he knew that he wasn't Mitchum's favorite director but hadn't realized how much Mitchum didn't like him. So, yeah. Yep. Uh Aldrich 
isn't on the picture. Sidney Pollock gets involved. He is coming off of The Way We Were, which is a big-ass hit. Makes ten times its budget back. Yeah. Um, and initially, they're talking to Redford. Um, and as Schrader says, Redford rightly uh, decided he was too young for the part. However, it probably would have made money. Um, but then Mitchum comes back into the fold. And uh, it's... You know, he he says um, it costs like two million dollars. They shot it all on location in Japan, ten or twelve weeks with a Japanese crew. Uh, it just costs a lot of money, but yeah, it, it comes out two months before the Iger sanction. Just to give you a little sense of where we mm-hmm. are relative to yep. our our previous stuff. Uh, shot by a Japanese cinematographer named Kozo Okazaki. The movie looks fucking incredible. This is it such does a good look looking movie. So good. The Warner Archive Blu-ray is uh, looks looks quite good. Yeah. No, it's just a minor note that uh, I was doing a thing that I don't like to do, which is uh, I had looked it up on Letterboxd, not for reviews. Don't, try not to read reviews before we see these films. But I accidentally saw your uh, previous review of this film. Now, was that f- based on what would we say the focus is <laughs> of the, this disappointment? You seem to have My felt. previous review... Of this film. I saw it in like 2015. Okay. I was in a bad mood. Gotcha. Um, I was okay. visiting my my friend who lived in Cleveland at the time. Incidentally, the friend I had traveled to Japan with and um, been, been force-fed paste uh-huh. with. Uh, and I missed my girlfriend and... Uh, my friend didn't have internet at the time because he was he had been using his uh upstairs neighbor's Wi-Fi and then they stopped paying for it. Um yep. so I was just sort of in a Okay. I was not in the, the greatest mood. Um and also I think I had a much I had a worse attention span, if you can believe it, and uh just a more black and white idea of who is allowed to tell what story or whatever. Yeah, and look, I think there are some shortcomings that we will we have to address here. So I'm not saying it's totally crazy, but mm-hmm. at least even from the first like two minutes, visually such a treat that I I basically would have watched like a bunch of nonsense if it was shot like this for for an hour and fifty minutes or whatever. Yeah, uh, and I have shot or watched a bunch of nonsense that's shot like <laughs> yeah. this. Um, so the film is about a guy named. Harry Kilmer. Harry Kilmer. I had it on the tip of my tongue. <laughs> yep. uh, a guy named Harry Kilmer who had been a U.S. serviceman in occupied Japan. Uh, He's got one of these classic fascinating relationships with this place that he occupied where he has like yes. a deep nostalgia for it. I'm, I'm more familiar with it from uh, like Vietnam vets. I thought you were going to say you have it from your current lifestyle where you are sort of an occupying force within sure i guess i'm Mexico. not trying to uh, at least superficially gun down the people living here and depose yeah. their government yeah well you said as you said you're more of a oaxacan katana guy <laughs> more of a knife right. a knife man um yeah yeah so he's a retired detective classic uh, Robert Mitchum noir type character. He is living in Southern California, which is where all detectives live. He lives on the beach. Yep. Uh, he's scra- always scratching his head and saying one more thing. So he is <laughs> called up by an old friend named George Tanner. George Tanner is, of mm-hmm. course, played by Brian Keith, who uh, is – he was Hardcastle from the show Hardcastle and McCormick. McCormick. Uh-huh. He was – Western TV star, but never on Rawhide, incidentally, from what I can tell. He was uh, a Marine radio man and tail gunner uh, in the Pacific Theater in World War II, so he actually actually lived this this life. Um, mm-hmm. And he's in a couple of uh, Burt Reynolds movies, he's in Hooper and Sharky's Machine, incidentally, and he... Uh, shot himself in the head in 1997 at his home in Malibu. Great place to do it. Yep. 
And Maureen O'Hara said that she believed he did not commit suicide and that he simply had accidentally shot himself in the head cleaning one of his many guns. So we report you decide. Yes, that's right. Yep. That's the right way to do it. So he gets called in. Yeah. Keith has gotten himself involved in a deal with some Yakuza guys in Japan uh, to provide them with guns. This is a very common bit of trade between the U.S. and the Yakuza uh, is sending guns over there. It's something like 40% of all guns that are uh, confiscated from Yakuza are U.S. made. Um, also but something's true gone where wrong. I live. Yes. And they have taken his daughter hostage yes. in order to get him to pay up. And if he doesn't pay up within the next few days, they're going to hurt his daughter. Um, so he calls in his old buddy. Harry Kilmer to go over there and figure out what's what. And Kilmer goes over there. Uh, th they had been like MPs in Tokyo during the app. They've been occupation cops, which is a job that you and I disapprove of. I think mm -hmm. it's fair to say. We sure do. And I think the film uh, obliquely gestures towards some very interesting things when, particularly when Kilmer gets there and he sees the new Tokyo, the new Japan. And he yeah. reflects, if there's any connection to Ozu, I don't think it's visual or uh, stylistic. It's in this, this concern or fixation with how Japan has changed and is bringing traditional values into a post-industrial, right. uh, extremely capitalized world, uh, particularly one where Japan has been defeated and yet now is in uh, like business partnership with america almost yep. exclusively uh and this is also reflected i think quite aptly in the sort of uh psychosexual metaphor of the film but we'll get to that yes. in a second yep. so it's revealed that uh he during the occupation he had um come across this woman named aiko who was uh working in the black market so that she could get medicine for her sick daughter uh, her sick baby daughter hanako he saves her life. They live together and he wants to marry her, but she won't marry him. And then her brother comes back from, he's been doing the sort of Hiro Onoda thing on a Philippine island, a holdout. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. And he comes back um, and he's apparently very angry that his sister is living with the enemy. Um, but also he is, of course, deeply grateful to this enemy for saving the life of his sister and niece. So this um, is where we get the first uh, invocation of giddy, uh, the duty. idea of duty, yeah. obligation, maybe burden, yeah. the greatest burden one can bear. Um, and he had set, uh, Kilmer had sets Aiko up with uh, a bar that she names Kilmer House in his honor, and then he leaves the country. So he's got the, he's holding, he's carrying the torch for her, but he knows they can't be together because of Ken. Ken, of course, played by Ken Takakura, or Takakura Ken, who is uh, one of the great stars of the Yakuza films. Schrader said his greatest regret about the failure of this film was that Takakura doesn't become a an international star. I mean, he's terrific. Yeah. yeah. I... He's one of those guys where I've only seen him in three movies, and I, I Black Rain? would have sworn, yes, Black Rain, now this, and Abishiri Prison, uh, but I would have bet anything that I hadn't seen him somewhere else because of his the strength of his screen presence yeah, and how one of these star he is. Yeah, it's like, uh, you know, uh, fucking, uh, what's the guy's name? Alden Ehrenreich, when I first saw him in Hail <laughs> yeah. Caesar. Mm-hmm. Like who's it? I know this guy, right? Because he's just right. so powerful. Yeah. Um, I I learned also that Ken Takakura is in the 1992 Tom Selleck film Mr. Baseball. Great name for a movie as well. Yeah, and he is in. Did you see this this uh, 1975 movie called The Bullet Train? Or in, yes, in the, the Japanese basis title for Speed Shinkansen Big Explosion. Yeah, yeah, this is a movie about a bullet train that has a bomb on it that'll go off if it if it gets below 80 kilometers an hour. I uh, did not know about this. So, Ken Takakura, he's just got presents for, for days. So beloved in Japan that he was referred to as Ken-san. We love this. Mr. We Ken. love when this happens, yeah. Yeah. But now, Kilmer is back in Tokyo, and 
uh, he goes to talk to Aiko because he wants to find Ken because he knows Ken had connections to the Yakuza. Yes, and I'm going to draw a pretty arbitrary line in the sand. This scene where he goes to see her at her... Uh, this is we would count this as an isekai, right? Isekai, you yeah, call it? yeah. Isekai uh, is like a it's a place that has beer and food that goes well with beer, basically. Yeah, that's like late nightish, right? Sort of neighborhood, yeah, vibe. Now, I think everything up to and including the scene works very well and works together very well. From this point on, I had the feeling that I was watching a few different movies. And I'm pretty sure that I like all three of the movies, but that is one of my only major complaints. And then I felt vindicated when I came out and uh, Paul Schrader said something quite similar, which is that basically he wrote one movie, Sidney Pollack was directing a different type of movie. And then also maybe Robert Town was bringing in some stuff that confused things further. I mean, that sounds right. I I think... There are a number of really interesting themes established in the film that it doesn't fully explore, um, to my liking anyway, that you've got this, well, let's just sort of round out the the plot really quick. Yeah, sure. Um, So he goes to, so so Ken is at his kendo school in Kyoto. Uh Yes, I had wooden kendo practice swords that I, my friends and I used to chop each other with. Yeah. I made a gigantic black mark on the ceiling that we couldn't remove because there there was a black painted kendo sword. Interesting. Mine were uh, sort of stained. Classic kind of wood color. Dark dark cherry color. I see. Yeah. Like a, well, a classic wood color, but maybe not the. He goes, uh, he takes a train to Kyoto, finds him, finds Ken in his kendo school, obviously just commanding the entire room. Um, Yep. And uh, Ken is out of the Yakuza, but he owes Kilmer this debt for saving his sister and daughter's life. The daughter, by the way, is now. A grown woman uh, played by Christina Kokubo, who is uh, an American actress. She's from Detroit, Michigan, not far from Grand Rapids. And no. she was in this. She's in Midway, the big epic World War II film that comes out in 1976. She does an episode of Hawaii Five O. She's on St. Elsewhere. And she also teaches acting or taught acting classes at the Braille Institute in LA here. Um, she like founded a nonprofit theater for the blind. Maybe cool it's because Pollock Yeah, maybe it's because Pollock uses her surgically. I liked her. She basically has one one and a half scenes yep. that are hers. And yep. I think she does a good job in both of them. Ken is gonna help the character's name is Ken Tanaka. Like that's how uh-huh. much Paul wanted it to be <laughs> Tuck. Yeah. He's gonna help. They figure out where the daughter is being held. Throughout all this there is a, a sort of um, a lackey, an American lackey, who was sent with, like I think, uh, at George Tanner's behest, named Dusty. Yeah, this is Richard by... Jordan. I love Richard Jordan, man. Doesn't I show up not... a lot. Interesting. Yeah, I didn't have that much familiarity with him. I don't know that I've seen. I mean, I've, I've I, I guess I've seen him in the Friends of Eddie Coyle. With, yeah, definitely. with uh, he's the uh, Mitchum cop or FBI agent or whatever. And of course, I know him from the the film The Defection of Simus Kudurka. That's <laughs> of course you do, uh, yeah. But I haven't seen Interiors or Logan's Run or uh, David Lynch's Dune. Most notably, we we referred to this. Uh, yeah, he he plays Duncan Idaho, the Jason Momoa character in in Dune. I mean, I think he basically just does an incredible job at being a oh, he's in Hunt for Red October. He is. I yeah. guess I knew him from that. Yeah, uh, second fiddle guy. Yeah. I don't know if he could carry a whole He's film, a, a hippie weeb, basically. He's the guy, you see him actively falling in love with the culture of Japan uh, through Hanukkah, mm-hmm. specifically. Which is also but, extremely weeb thing to do, to not be yeah, able yeah, to yeah. pry apart your attraction to a person and a culture. Uh, yeah. Now I live in a different country and I'm in a relationship with somebody from a different culture, so. <laughs> well, I was going to say, I just I had this thought recently that, because I'm, you know, I think I'm pretty, I think I'm pretty, I think pretty too. Uh, Thank you. I'm very happy in my very long-term relationship, and I, I have no intention of changing anything about that. But I did end up in, you know, sort of as as a part of my girlfriend's family, 
you know, her stepmother is Thai, moved here from Thailand when she was seven, but their, you mm-hmm. know, their house is familiar to me as a white people house, basically. Okay. And yep. I did think that, I, you know, in my romantic career, which I think is sort of reached it's i've i feel i feel that i've beaten the game you got the corner suite i managed to kind of avoid ever having to learn another kind of house to mm. be in as uh as a boyfriend you know what i mean i do I know what managed you mean. to say this as unracistly you, as possible you have i think you did a wonderful job well i remember like i had a friend named varun in in fifth grade whose parents were from india and i remember going to his house and I had a lot of stuff I had to learn about how I was how I was to behave in that house, and I just think well, you know if we're talking about uh, the human experience, one of the one of the interesting parts of it is learning how differently other people live their lives from yours. And uh, generally, when you're making like a platonic friend, you don't hang out at their parents' house that much. So the only yeah. opportunity really to get uh, after you after you turn eighteen, you know, to get this sort of experiences, uh, I guess to date somebody, but oftentimes, who yeah. cares about all that bullshit? Well, I you would know? just say that I, as a a person who, I think finds that to be one of the true pleasures of being alive is to encounter date other foreign ways women, of life, yep, yep. <laughs> and recognizing the limits of your experience. I think, at least for me, the big takeaway is just make sure that you are separating your enjoyment and hopefully your respectable engagement with this yeah. culture yeah. from yeah. your uh, sort of like creation of an avatar of that culture in the form of this person that you are either befriending or uh, in well, look, investigating I mean, it is, a relationship with. It is also fascinating simply to learn like how my girlfriend's parents organized their fridge you know, yeah. I mean, there's, there, it's not like it all has to be, they listen to the show. Well, uh, uh-huh. her dad listens to the show. Every time I go into their, to the bathroom there, the sort of like guest bathroom, uh, his camelback, uh, uh, hiking water mm-hmm. backpack is hanging limply in the, over the bathtub to, to dry after he's cleaned it from his most yep. recent hike. And this is obviously a, a new, fresh experience to me. So it's, it's, there are, but I think, the important thing is that you are not yeah. dating that experience, right? You are not confused no. about no, the no, fact no. that you are dating no. a human person yeah. who happens to have that. And that's kind of a nice bonus, interesting uh, secondary aspect, right? But you are not, yeah. as these people often are, trying to date Japan. <laughs> um, exactly. I'm just going to fill for time here while Ian goes and takes down the chart behind him that says women types. It has a bunch of check marks on it. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> nah, 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 nah. Nah. That's the sort of the dusty role. There's also the the home base for Kilmer's expedition to Japan is the home of his friend Oliver Wheat, yeah. played by Herb Edelman, who looks like a Herb Edelman a lot more than he looks sure. like an Oliver Wheat. Sure does, but this guy's yeah. got obviously the coolest house anyone's ever had. Uh, and it's covered in samurai swords and uh, and fucking uh, uh, like buses and yeah yeah priceless artifacts and also yep. little kitty cats including mm-hmm. the tiniest little I guess Siamese kitten. He what really kind of- manhandles the hell out of these cats, but it seems like they're having a good time because they turn around, they go yeah. back for more. And if anyone has gotten this far in the episode without having decided whether or not to watch the movie, the cats are fine, by the way. Nothing yeah. happens to the cats. Nope. Um, except they get, like, uh, petted and they, they, they sure do. run around in the background. So they they go to get Louise and Ken ends up killing somebody. So now they're all they're all into the mix here. The, they're all... The sort of vendetta web uh, of... Yes. Because Ken had this uh, debt of honor debt of duty to kilmer now kilmer knows that ken is in trouble right so does he have a responsibility to ken and on top of that i think we have what is to me a distinctly robert towney style uh Mm -hmm. sort of like machinations of people that maybe we we weren't aware of at the beginning also classic neo-noir stuff you know this is where chinatown comes from kilmer goes to see ken's brother goro who is a and they call him an Oyabun. He's like the he's a high level advisor. That's sort of 
from what I can tell, kind of a anachronistic mm. way to because he he seems like he's sort of a consigliere to like several yeah yakuza I think, families. Oh, I think so too. Yeah, but the Oyabun is just like the leader. It's just like the the god the dawn. Normally, uh, right. The actual as, yeah. as Paul Schrader says in this primer, the Godfather. Uh, yes, and also worth noting that up to this point and beyond this point. Schrader and company have been including several of the genre hallmarks. Uh, in in the primer, he discusses what is it, ten or twelve scenes that yeah. he considers basically signature. I love to be a white guy uh, charting out the yeah. the characteristics of a foreign art. And I gotta say, as as relevant as they were to other parts of this, like the like the yakuza specifically, I watched Avashiri Prison and. There's a kind of a couple of these in the movie. It yeah. doesn't really fit with his description at all. But uh, anyway, he says that in these uh, chivalry films, you basically get a remix where they're picking like six out of ten of them to yeah. put. And it's just a requirement. If you don't have at least that many, you're not really making one of these films. And we get a bunch of them in this, in this movie. Exactly. So they go to Goro. Goro says you sort of basically you are the most Japanese guy gene of all time, you are so honorable <laughs> yes. as to be, yeah. as to essentially owe him the, the same special kind of Japanese debt that only Japanese people can owe to each other uh, because he has put himself in danger to help you. And this is, of course, getting down to the crux of the genre, which is the division between two competing forces, at least as Schrader characterizes it duty and humanity yes yeah which i think as a basis for a genre film if this is accurate interesting it's interesting sure. enough to me i think uh yeah whether or not this this really characterizes all these movies i can't say for sure but the basic idea and unfortunately it's sort of orientalized into sort of like a type of conflict that no white man has ever faced in their life right but yeah uh maybe more reasonably we can say that in this culture that has a different cultural heritage with this uh, combination of Confucianist and Buddhist and uh, Bushido Shinto. origins, exactly, yeah. um, that they've come up with this concern for hierarchy, for loyalty, for respect, and for duty, of course. And on the other hand, we have, I don't know if it's exactly associated with modernism or humanism or uh, just general shifts towards like a humanitarian interest or something but we have this idea of of just caring for people as people in in and of right. themselves right 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 what is more important the law or what the law is intended to protect you know right yep uh do a super quick yakuza primer of my own oh i'm so this ready is not for this man on the film but rather on the type of guy so yep. The Yakuza are, you know, they're often sort of understood as Japan's mafia. And like many things about Japan, due to its complicated history as both imperial dominator and imperial subject, complicated history as closed off to the West and then rapidly trying to compete with and then just partner with the West. This is a you know there's there's always an obvious point of comparison that can't quite cover all the nuances of yes. of what the yakuza are because you know Japan is a much more ethnically homogeneous society than almost any other in the world so so you know the the sort of ethnic mafias that you get in the United States for example the Italian and the Russian and the Jewish and the, and the uh, triads and, and the yeah. Irish and I'd give up every computer in the world to bring back the Irish mob. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, because of this, the Yakuza operate much, in some ways, from and for most of their history, much more tightly with the with like legitimate society, if you want to call it that, than do the mob, uh, for example. So and. I have a question because you you did the research and you've been to the nation and I'm sure like Leonard you absorbed all the nuances of this history. Uh, so there's semi 
proletarian origins to this, both in, in what we get in the film, their description, and then also maybe some, some labor origins. Tell us about this. Well, yeah. So I, th- my understanding of this, and I've tried to peruse the major t- uh, English text on the Yakuza, which is uh, called Yakuza Japan's Mafia Guys, or what, what is it called? <laughs> uh, I don't remember. Yakuza... Japan's Criminal Underworld. Japan's Criminal Underworld by David Kaplan and Alec Dubro. This is like in a case you're book. uncertain about how definitive this is. I just searched Yakuza book because I knew that it would come up first. There you go. So, from from what I can tell, these are kind of the the Yakuza kind of represent the holdover of a hold of one of the ways that the tradition has held over past the major res- restoration and the mm. post-war push for more and more westernization in uh 1876 i think uh let me find the uh it was an edict the haito edict in 1876 sometimes called the sword abolishment edict ah uh, yeah i thought it might be uh, this one by the Meiji government, um, prohibited basically anyone from carrying weapons in public, specifically swords. And so this is one of the ways that the Meiji government, which was like this big, this government that served uh, to, to push Japan into a major, major transition from traditional feudal yes. system to what ends up becoming like the empire of world war two and and beyond big westernization push um so they they get rid of they they make it uh illegal for most people to carry swords and basically put the nail in the coffin of the samurai class um there's also at this time like uh universal military conscription uh instead of having samurai kind of control some of military activity so it's Uh uh-huh it's all part of this. And so you get kind of this uh, criminalization of Bushido code um, and samurai, the samurai image sort of all at once. Now, there's two different sort of uh, predecessors to the Yakuza, two different groups that sort of combine to form the Yakuza. So you have Tekia, who are... Sort of the equivalent of carnies, not exactly, obviously, but they're like, um, <laughs> okay, uh, like they they sell stolen goods. They're they're like they they set up uh tents and like stalls and stuff at festivals and near temples and all kinds of stuff to sell little stuff, and mm-hmm. uh, they sort of organize into systems of protection for one another and also demand protection money from non-affiliated stall owners and stuff. Gotcha. And then uh, this is also seen as a lower class occupation. Right. Similarly, you have the Bakuto who are people who uh, organize gambling, which is as as in many places seen as a, a low class and uh, legally dubious or just straight up illegal thing to do and like you know the you see this all over the world much of vice is controlled by people who belong to some kind of underclass already so they can't really find success in legitimate means yeah uh and so there is a a a group in japan called the burakumin who are uh Ethnic Japanese people. It's like a, it's it's like a low caste system. These are people who were gotcha. like undertakers and butchers and slaughterhouse workers. Generally, people who worked with death or like did jobs that nobody else wanted to do. Hmm. And this does like stick to people in a way that I don't fully understand. I watched a, a YouTube documentary about Burakumin people who still like. There's a whole problem of hate speech online about Barakumin people, and it's like, wow, how do it you persist? How, I how see. do you know exactly? Yeah, yeah. Because I, I don't know that it sticks to you just because of your job. Because there's like there, you know, there was a, a a guy who seems to work for some kind of large lobbying organization devoted to the betterment of this group of people, and he, mm. you know, 
he you looking at him it's not obvious that this guy is like a butcher or something yeah, yeah. um and then you also have ethnic koreans who are a huge part of japanese culture but a very very uneasy subject well, yeah uh, imperial for all kinds of reasons yeah yeah yes and so the yakuza well the Barakaman and the and ethnic koreans both um can find mobility in these illicit activities and eventually this sort of consolidates into uh an organized crime system called the yakuza um and they cultivate and and often enjoy among uh you know regular japanese people civilians if you if you like uh, a kind of Robin Hood image, a kind mm-hmm. of, I mean, you know, a, or a John Derringer image, uh, in, in much like the Outlaws of the Depression, uh, or Jesse James or something. It's very moment dependent. Like people, uh, the the image of the Yakuza was very different in the fifties and sixties than it is now. For example, um, do you want to say John for, Dillinger really fast? What did I say? John Derringer. Yeah, well, think about it. John <laughs> Dillinger. Yep. Um <laughs> uh so they were and and as I said, like mafia isn't quite the right term for it because like Yakuza headquarters will have their fucking logo on the building. Yeah. Like yep. there's of course the full body tattoo thing, there's the pinky cutting thing, there's there's these ways of sort of marking your body so that you can't quite get out of the life right but these guys get involved obviously in all of the vice stuff uh apparently a lot of methamphetamine um weapons uh gambling human trafficking prosti- prostitution hu- yeah. human trafficking of women especially from the philippines to become sex slaves um pornography both adult and child but then also like fi- like high level financial stuff like there's this whole thing where uh i've heard about this you're talking about the shame thing the public shaming the public shame- shaming thing at at um fucking uh shareholder meetings yeah this yeah. Was, this it- i'd heard about before this is fascinating so um yeah, let me find the term for it. Uh, Yakuza shareholder. Obviously, we're engaging in a, a bit of etic anthropology ourselves, but I think the characterization is that this is only possible in a culture that is so interested in in honor and public reputation. Yes. Yeah, so there's a there's a a um, God. This is all coming up with fucking strategy guides for shareholder meeting <sighs> levels of the Yakuza video game. Um, <laughs> Uh, Sokaya. Sokaya Sokaya is a mm-hmm. uh, it's a it's a type of corporate blackmail where people will go to these public shareholder meetings, which are not exactly shareholder meetings for, you know, imperfect comparison reasons that I've I've already tried to elucidate. But like this thing where Japanese corporations have to basically give public statements to mm-hmm. shareholders on a regular basis and uh because specifically because there was unlimited liability for business leaders as opposed to limited liability of, of oh, okay. LLC. So fame. all your goods are on the line. Yes. Uh for the manager specifically, it was easy to black blackmail management by threatening either to expose actual corruption or just to sow uh belief like misinformation. in, in uh-huh. all artificial corruption, especially at these shareholder meetings. And so you can blackmail somebody by saying, hey, I'm going to show up and say that you, uh, you know, you kiss your dog on the mouth unless you pay me this right. much money. Um, this is why which, it's like a totally unique synthesis of yes. both Western capitalism and this historical, right. hierarchical, honor-based system. And because of this, the Yakuza are like deeply involved in a whole lot of very high level financial dealings in a way mm-hmm. that um obviously organized crime obviously hedge fund management is is 
organized crime that's a legal, type of right? organized crime yes right yeah and all of that but we don't but, associate it with the mafia yes. necessarily we don't think of whitey bulger as also being a huge uh, as as being like a warren buffett style right. market operative yes um, yep because yeah like the like yeah the yakuza are are uh among the wealthiest criminal organizations like in the in the world and returning to our film very briefly i think we get this Funnily enough, in a positive character, the the brother character who walks out of this massive corporate structure, yeah. literal really structure, cool building, yeah. Uh-huh. Um. So, so the yakuza, as I've tried to explain, are a mafia that is distinctly yep. uh, of of Japanese. Uh, it can only exist in this particular society that has uh, had this particular history. Um. But they are able to cultivate this sort of noble outlaw Robin Hood style right. uh, image for a number of reasons. One of which is, and I, I apologies to the listener if you understand this better than I do. Please feel free to write in. But like, it's taken a long time for a lot of this stuff to be easily enforced uh-huh. against by the. The government to the point where, and I don't know if that's just corruption. I don't know if that's because of the nature of the Japanese constitution. I don't know. But uh, there has, in the past like 10, 20 years, been an, a, a lot of very significant and very successful anti Yakuza legislation, but almost all of it focuses on punishing people, punishing like non Aha, legitimate Yakuza organizations who affiliate yes. with the, uh, yeah. And uh, which this is tied, I think, with a beautiful cultural uh, uh, sort of like 1970s style shift in language. What do they call them now? Like armed criminal groups or something? They yeah, to yeah, try yeah. to There's, dispel yeah. this air of, of to try to get get rid of the cool word yakuza yeah. that we associate with the fun video game or whatever. Yeah. Um, and so, of course, and like much of Japanese society, they're also aging and young people are not joining and they're dying off you know in Mm. in the 80s i think there were like 180,000 people uh, affiliated members of the yakuza and now it's like 22,000 or something it's just like a you know it's it's dying off basically uh but what is interesting about these guys also like many i mean it, it is obvious that a a an organization that is set up as a series of uh, father son or big brother little brother relationships and and exercises might through violence they're fascists and they are very closely associated with the very far right of japan's political movement which is very interesting to me because and i mean it, it, you see it also with certain minority groups in the u.s um, for example, like Cubans in Florida, um, yep. where where these people who are an underclass who are discriminated against by the establishment, like these these uh, Burakumin and the uh, ethnic Korean Japanese people, would nonetheless support like ultra nationalist uh, causes. I I assume perhaps as a sense uh, in, in a in in the interest of uh, seeking legitimacy well i think it's a historical basis for all fascism right is is a, an appeal usually by somebody from a superior group to the working class uh making the claim that there's some type of subversive group some type of degenerate group that threatens that's the real reason that they are in that position right it is not in fact right right uh the the hierarchical hierarchical structure itself uh it is it is some type of uh nasty corrupt development that needs to be rooted out yeah. Yeah. There's uh and this can go the other way too, where you know that some at least early on, some of the Yakuza clans were affiliated with labor unions because again, when you're at sort of at the the cusp of what is like actually legally protected by yeah. the state, there's uh plenty of opportunity for alternative forms of protection to to mm-hmm come in and say hey we'll we'll help you get your get your needs met and like for example the yamaguchi gumi who are the biggest yakuza organization 
The uh, one that Leonard Schrader was uh, yes hanging out by with. his characterization, buddy buddy with. Uh huh. Yeah, they you know they've done large scale relief efforts after earthquakes. Yeah, like opening up Yakuza headquarters as like uh, uh, shelters before yeah. the government can can you know turn the the big gears of of bureaucracy to get things done. And it's you know in a it's a it's a distinctly Japanese way of being a criminal organization in that like they launched a newsletter in 2013 okay. for members that has just like articles like it, it's got like you know opinion pieces and then also columns on fishing wow. like it's wonderful yeah and then there are also fan magazines for the yakuza yeah. or there at least have been historically um so yeah this is uh it's a it's a complicated and difficult to fully compare to any any understanding of of organized crime that, that we have in the west however i do think that and and schrader points this out in his primer uh the godfather released uh, in 72 and Godfather 2 uh, just the year before this movie both prove uh, America's hunger for the image of of kind of noble outlaws and, and codes of conduct and chivalry especially I don't you know whatever post Watergate post post 68 who knows but like like uh, post of it, uh, the, the center not holding but I'm glad you brought that yes. up because Schrader mentions the Godfather to draw a distinction not necessarily between the the yakuza themselves, but the this type of chivalry yakuza film that he's talking about, right? Because what he says is that the people in these films are undergoing an uh, uh, like a moral struggle, a uh, humanitarian struggle to figure out what is the right path forward, and they're put in an impossible position. Which is why he says, for him, despite its popularity with the far rights. We get a shout out of Mishima, who's a fan right. of these films and writes in their defense. And a, uh, he, and a, a associate of Leonard Schrader at this at this time. They yep. also they they've they meet at least a couple times uh, before right. Mishima's suicide. But Schrader says this is distinct from The Godfather because that he he uh, groups with Dirty Harry, of course, as a as an expression of a uniquely american comfort with like open fascist symbolism right yes Saying he does mention dirty hair yeah this is people looking for a desire for punishment or domination uh sort of uh, like violent masculine re repression exactly looking whereas he says daddy. yeah these films are about struggling with daddy basically and sort of like who who are we now yeah, and he says they're as popular with student radicals. And then he says the kind of crazy thing that you can just dismiss, I'm, which is he says that yeah. student radicals have been known to watch these films a hundred times before they go to a protest. To, uh, right, like the Panthers watching Battle of Algiers, but right. fake. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Um, and also trying to wrap my head around the exact character of Japanese student activism has also been difficult because it has its own flavor distinct yeah. from American and French student activism that I'm more familiar with. So you can also see how, you know, right wing ideology and nationalist nationalist ideology and this idea of traditional values, even if it's extremely skewed from like, I don't know that a samurai from uh, 1641 would see a Yakuza guy hitting someone with a bicycle, which is apparently a real thing that they liked to do. Whoa. Uh, it's great. Yeah, uh, uh, it's great cinema. I will say. Yeah. This is something uh, that I don't know Taki that he would Fair see Ken it. Does. Some guy hitting somebody with a bicycle and say, you are like me. He would <laughs> yeah. probably say like, you are a Korean dog and like kill him with a sword, you know? But that's uh, the complexity of yeah. historical continuity, right? It sure is, but you can see how this would appeal to plenty of folks seeing their country rapidly become a puppet of the West and all of that. Yes, um, and you can see how it would be appealing to foreigners who are interested in Japanese culture and maybe want to find the things that feel more distinctly Japanese. Again, not in like an ethnic yeah. blood sense, but a cultural sense. Yeah, young men who feel that the world is 
not fully under their control would would uh, probably find a strict code of warrior ethics appealing and uh that i don't think will come up in any more paul schrader movies so we don't have to think about it any further. <laughs> yeah. yep yeah I, I mean just a sort of a, a last thoughts uh very robert town style it turns out that ken yeah. is actually aiko's husband so and part Hanako's of my objection to daughter. this yeah uh is that it's fairly obvious from earlier on, and I almost wish that they didn't play it. I, I will say that the disclosure scene is another one of these these uh, Yakuza genre classics yeah. that Schrader yeah. says. So it makes sense that he waits to do this. But there's a whole setup of Aiko saying that she has secrets and Ken is extremely resentful. It seems like the only arrangement that makes any sense. And then we get a surprise brother. So I don't mind it, but... Right. Given that, well, that yeah. Robert Town has a tendency to go for these things, I wish that it wasn't played as such a revelation because right. it seems like it's not that interesting. It doesn't really change that much, I guess. Well, I do think we get a a very interesting and especially f- fairly fairly radical or, or surprising uh, metaphor for an American film where, you know, this, this cuckolding of... Yeah. Ken by Harry Kilmer, I think is is directly like literally compared to the kind of cuckolding of Japan by Western overlords. Uh, well, and it's also interesting because his act of humanity creates this this relationship yeah. of duty, right? Right. right so right. it's it's an unusual order, a subordination of one right. to the other. The very uh, humane act of dropping. Two nuclear weapons on civilian population. <laughs> Not I mean. What I'm talking about. What? Okay. Uh, so there's an attack on. Uh, there's an attack on on Oliver Wheat's place where uh, both Dusty and Hanako are killed, which sucks. Uh, and then it turns out that Tanner has put the hit out for kind of noir reasons that yes. I don't don't care to fully untangle for for my own. Uh, Interesting. Enjoyment I, of the film. This was one of the things that people objected to. Is sort of like this is inscrutable plot. I didn't find well, this plot I, I mean, to be. I'm not going to use the word inscrutable in reference to this film in any way. But uh, I, it's just one of those things where, like, the thing with film noir is that you you often end up sort of learning this web of interconnections that turns out to be fake, and you quickly have to learn what yeah. the actual web of interconnections is. And sometimes I kind of get the gist that everyone feels betrayed without having to, yeah. like I couldn't draw I, you up. I couldn't draw you a chart, but I, okay. I get it. I think the more important thing, like you're saying is how it changes the human yeah. relationships. And we get right. that here, I think very uh, handily. So then uh, they're going to go to uh, Tono, who is the, the Yakuza boss. They're going to go to his house and, uh, attack everybody. There's a cool fight scene that lasts a long time, and Tucker too Kirk long. looks really cool. Way yeah, too long. It is this too is long. one of the um, the other critiques that I did agree with. Somebody said yes. that. Uh, I actually think it's pretty. I I don't think that uh, it's is visually unappealing. Somebody was saying that Pollock yeah. doesn't know yeah. how to shoot action. I don't know if that's quite true. I think particularly right. We see three days of the Condor later. Well, he knows how to effective. shoot horses, doesn't he? Sure. Well, yeah. Is that yeah. is that anything? Not really. Wait. Uh-huh. Hold on. Wait, wait, I, I can watch this. Uh, Great. Yes. Yeah, that was asked and answered. Uh, uh, there's but, a sequence in this where... So Goro has told Ken that he has a son who is in Tono's gang, and he's got a spider tattoo on his head, and please don't kill my son, brother. Yeah. And then uh, Ken finds himself sort of, I think, overcome with overcome with with grief over his own daughter's death. He kills Goro. But the problem with that for me is that it's... Or kills Goro's it, son, rather. Kills like, Goro's son. It's happening like, I don't know, six minutes into this fight. And I think if you're telling the type of fairly romantic story that that Pollock is telling, then I think you either have to pick brutish and short action or long and emotionally clear uh so tied to clear 
motivation or significance for people. And what we get here is, for me, a stylistic exercise of a pretty long fight that is cool, yeah. but you, at least for me, I've almost forgotten how we're supposed to be feeling yeah. about Hanako's death until suddenly this right, happens right, again. Right, right, right. Paul Schrader himself kind of nasty, brutish, and short. <laughs> okay. If you think about it. Yep. Um, so, I gotta see if Audacity has a an effect to remove snot from the <laughs> I would have killed for Audio. this in my yes. laughter recently. Uh, uh, so then Ken ever the honorable Yakuza goes to his brother and is going to commit seppuku. He's going to kill himself uh, uh, sort of to atone for this. And Goro says, like, don't bring any more grief to the family. Again, so abdicating Ken, this traditional yes. duty structure in favor of humanity. Uh, right. Exactly. And so Ken performs Yubitsume, the famous severing of the finger, mm -hmm. uh, as atonement. Now, in actual Yubitsume, there, uh, apparently you kind of go knuckle by knuckle so that you I, can do it again if you have to. Or uh, I suppose, depending on the gravity of the offense, you might cut off more than one knuckle in the way that some things cost $1 and some things cost 3 <laughs> Yes. I think... Either they go into more detail about this in Black Rain, or I just read about when I watched Black Rain, but I remember. Yes. But they this. also, uh, this has, the, both the tattooing and the pinky have fallen out of favor with younger Yakuza because it's obviously harder to conceal. Hide. Your, yeah. So I guess this is another another casualty of surveillance society is that no one has a cool cut off pinky anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and Ugh. then I also, there's an article about a Japanese doctor. Uh, who makes prosthetic pinkies for former Yakuza so that they can mm. go do reintegrate. Yeah, yes. Cool. Um, well, that's cool. And then uh, Kilmer, Kilmer starts to leave. Kilmer starts to leave. No, Kilmer sh Kilmer's gonna go. He's gonna leave Japan, and then right. he goes to see Ken. Uh, and he himself commits Yubitsume, this sort of finalizing his transformation into the world's first Japanese white boy. Yeah, uh, it is corny, and it works for me. I enjoyed it yeah, in the moment. Of course. Because well, it's, mostly because it's, we Mitchum. haven't even really yeah. talked about Mitchum. Uh, it's just Mitchum and Takaka working together, and it's a beautiful thing. Mitchum, I will say, is so scary that Sometimes his his softened edges here are not yeah. quite believable for me. He's yeah. He will always be Knight of the Hunter and Kate Fear Mitchum to me. But yeah, he's he's a wonderful. He's actor. capable of. I mean, I think that's what's compelling about him in this. Both him and Takakura is that they are so cool and still, but you can tell that they're capable of violence. That they're, they're yeah. Something is is uh. I think tightly right. coiled that's within them. Much very like noir me. as well. Uh -huh. Uh, different sort of tight coiling. Intestinal. Nasty. Come yep. on. Uh, so, he cuts his finger off and they both say, I love you, bro. Uh, <laughs> and they say, it's yeah, couldn't moving. have a better friend. Yeah. It's moving. And then they bow formally to each other at the airport, much like they you do. and I do whenever yep. I take you there. That's uh, right. So, uh, that's you wear the those, Yakuza. You wear those beautiful sunglasses that I must shout out that Dr. Yeah, yeah, can wear. Yeah, great sunglasses. I mean... <laughs> Great fucking clothes on everybody in yeah. this movie, Ooh, obviously. it's a turtleneck uh, bonanza. Yeah, and, uh, you know, the shots of the streets of Tokyo in, obviously, this is the lamest fucking shit you can say, but Tokyo in 1974 looks really cool. It I don't does. know what to tell you. It does. Yep. Um, I'm going to talk to Jeremy about getting a Kilmer House t-shirt oh, made. Cool. Hell yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I we, we were sort of hinting at it, but I think... A young man brought up in a very, an extremely strict uh, set of obligations to family and God uh, that are based not even necessarily on any particular reward as much as they're based on obligation and, and uh, sort of unpayable debt. It would make sense that the culture of the Yakuza, or at least as much as the, the culture of, of Yakuza on film, would appeal to a Paul Schrader type. Yeah, and I'll say that 
I am a, if not believer, then a then a fan of deontology. So if if for my philosophy heads out there, this idea that one of the ways that you can guide your actions is by understanding ethics as a series of rules or duties, but hopefully not. And this is a distinction from uh, what we're seeing on on screen here. Not elevating those rules above humans themselves, right? A huge part of, of deontology is not instrumentalizing other people, uh, not not treating humans as an end, or pardon me, as a means rather than an end. But I think it's cool because we're seeing both the benefits and the shortcomings here. On the one hand, we see Dusty realize that he is sort of like our little Christian Catholic uh, uh, representative on screen. And he comes to understand that maybe there is a benefit in believing that we do things just for the 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 fruits that we will see here on earth not for a heavenly reward or something and that's right, why he right. comes forward and admits that he was involved with this plot uh kind of secondarily but on the other hand we also see that maybe this type of uh obsession with duty especially when it's subordinated into existing power structures which i think is the case here right this is where it gets mixed up with like you're saying this this Confucianism style filial p- piety type stuff, right? Then yeah. the rules are not about serving other people. They're about serving these sort of like institutional powers, right? And then, then it becomes a yeah. problem that maybe causes more death than anything else. Very well put. Uh, we actually next week are having two guests on the show. First, <laughs> sure, Christian no, Catholic, uh, and then Phil E.L. Piety. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean... I don't know. I'm excited about talking about this guy. He's fucking crazy, man. He's like a super, super Me interesting, too, weird guy. Can't stop reading and writing. Yeah. Uh, but also somebody just who so feels so intensely of, and loudly and yeah, so intellectual and so uh, brutish at the same time. <laughs> right. Um, I have a sort of a Coca-Cola tracking project for Ooh, us. Okay. What do we got? Um. So for for newer listeners, uh. There was a a suggestion in one of the Clint biographies. Well, first of all, there exists no published book length biography of Paul Schrader. Great. And buddy, do you know how to get a book deal? Because <laughs> we're writing it. It's happening. I think right we now. should we should do it. Yeah. Copyright us. Um so for for newer listeners, one of the, the biographies of Clint Eastwood suggested that because of some personal slight by the columbia corporation which was owned by the columbia pictures studio which was owned by coca-cola clint eastwood wouldn't allow coca-cola to be in any of his films for like decades and we proved that this is basically not true uh and similarly paul schrader recently said in some form of press that he is now working on a film about sexual obsession yep uh, which he's never written about before (laughs) and so He he just heard about this what I would like to prove or to look out for is, has over the course of his career, Paul Schrader ever been involved with a film that is not about sexual obsession, <laughs> at least partially? <laughs> so I think this uh, one does not fit the bill. Nope. There's a form of sexual obsession here. Uh, there's several, actually. Yep. And um, so you're 0 for 1, Paul. Uh, and also, I think we mentioned this, but we're keeping journals. How's your journaling coming? Great. I got two entries so far. How you doing? Okay. I got one. Uh, okay. Let me go grab it. I, I have a, an idea for a closing segment of the show, which is uh, where we pick a sentence out of context and perhaps the most humorous out of context sentence. Okay. I thought about this as well. This it, same idea occurred to me. I'm hoping that we can avoid writing towards this. <laughs> yes. Well, my whole first <laughs> entry is about that and, you know. Yeah. Do I do I try to drive myself crazy on purpose for the show, or do I just no. simply allow that it'll happen by itself? Yeah. But I think we can uh, we can hold ourselves to this. I think we're powerful enough to okay. hold ourselves. I think so to... too. I think we can be honest, or at least yes. try to be honest. Let me give this a quick scan to figure out. Yeah, I've got funny. mine. I'm going to go first. All right. About time I admit that cooking whitefish isn't one of my talents, and I should just buy something tinned. <laughs> okay. So you were a. Uh, you were sort of trying to exercise a mid-century British man who was briefly occupying your your heart. Yeah, like uh, like the little girl in Conjuring Two. No, I uh, I just fucked up some frozen cod pretty bad. 
Mm. Um, and because I tried to cook it all at once, like meal prep, so I ended up fucking up like twenty five dollars worth of frozen cod <laughs> and throwing it all away. <laughs> That's rough, man. Uh, you can't turn it yeah. into a soup or something. I don't want to eat it. I don't want it in my body. Like it's mm. disgusting to me. It's okay. it's yeah, it's revolting. Right. <laughs> Ian just reads March fourth. That's all he's got. <laughs> always always willing to share. Yeah. Uh, okay. This isn't really funny. I don't know that I have any funny sentences, but it doesn't have to be funny. Just to, okay. you know, just how about hmm? How about a little? All hmm. right. Uh, I really believe that the passive mistreatment of the creatures there is more attributable to ignorance than malice, but it makes little difference to the question of their suffering. Could not have predicted that you would be closer to Travis Bickle already than me. <laughs> Could not have, in, in a million years, I would not have predicted this. Man. Hey, man. Somebody needs to keep an eye on my co-host. <laughs> sure, uh, well, that's what you're here for. I've always considered this a so. type of public health project that we do for each yeah, other and exactly sort society. of a supervised visitation um, yeah yeah well thanks man uh that has been our episode on the yakuza paul cassie for me is is uh a go yep we're off to a roaring yeah. start i think uh we will be back next week with an episode on the taxi's driver Mm. Uh, which is, I guess, one another one of these sort of early works of uh, juvenilia yeah. that that nobody really remembers. Not familiar um, myself. Feeling normal about it. Feeling perfectly fine. I think it's cool. It's like if we had to do Unforgiven second, and then just do the rest. Well, of we did have to do Dirty Harry second. So I guess. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Anyway, it'll be fine. Uh, remember right. to subscribe, rate us, write a review. Helps us on the algorithm. If you like the show, tell a friend, tell your dad, uh, write about it in your journal, and then um, have your journal become written on the news for some kind of reason that it's legal to endorse. Follow us on yeah. Twitter and Instagram at Podcasty for me. If you have any comments, questions, or concerns, or you're interested in co-hosting a two-person Paul Schrader podcast, you can email us at podcastyforme at gmail.com. Thank you to Jeremy Allison for our artwork. Taxi driver next week. We'll see you there. Uh, are you talking to me? Bye. Bye.